appreciate that. You know, in our society today, in the culture that we live in, 70 to 80% of all of our churches have been either stagnated or declining over the last 10 years. If churches in America are stagnated or declining, how do we stay in the function of sending out missionaries and impacting a culture that needs Jesus? See, because our missionaries can only go on the field if the people of the churches decide that it's important to them to evangelize the world. You know, it found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 is this. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I read that, and I said, Okay, but how? How does that take place? How can we engage our culture? If our churches are, are stagnated, are we declining, and there's no evangelism in the United States, how are we going to impact the world? So I started thinking about, how can that take place? You go all the way back to Jesus' day. You go back to the day when he chose his disciples. And the disciples watched him heal, watched him forgive, watched him have power over the elements, watched him be crucified. With all their sadness within their heart, thinking that Jesus is dead, three days later, he rose from the grave, has the power and authority over all the elements. Then he stands before his disciples, being ready to be ascended into heaven. He gives the church this scripture. He says, go. And the disciples took this great commission. And they said, it is my power. It is the power that God has given to me to go into all the world. And then just a few days later, the church started. In Acts chapter 2, this young church, Peter got up and preached, and 3,000 people gave their life to Christ. And they started with the power of God. And we can take that same power that God has given to the early church in Acts chapter 2, and he can have that power with us today. And if we take those elements in the mission of the church from Acts chapter 2 into Wichita, Kansas today, we can take those same elements and have power and have authority and not be ashamed and stay on mission and stay on course to accomplish God's goal for the church. Go! Go into all the world, baptizing them because they know me as their Savior. I give you authority. I give you power. I'll give you the ability to do it. But sometimes in the culture that we live in, we go on coast mode. The video that we watch, we talk about the things of our society, the things of our church. We, they don't like this or we don't like that. And we have to remember in the back of our minds, it's not about our comfort. It's about our mission. It's not about what we like. It's what does God want? And if we have a passion that we want to do what God wants us to do, and we want to evangelize the world because that's God's power. It's his mission. It's not his suggestion. The last thing that Jesus told his disciples, he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples. It's our job. It's our calling. It's our mandate. And if we take that seriously... We can look at what God has called us to do. We can take that and we can do what God has called us to do by doing simple things. And I want to take Acts chapter 2. And Al, I'm going to do this rapidly, okay? I'm going to do this rapidly. I'm going to take Acts chapter 2 and give you some characteristics of the early church. Found in Acts chapter 2. And if we can take these and apply them to our heart and to our church and to our lives we can have that same power that God gave to the early church. We won't look about what we're comfortable with or what we like. We're looking at what does God want. Do we have the heart and the passion of God? The first thing, there was a hunger to hear God's word. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. They had a hunger from God. They wanted to hear God's heart they wanted to hear what God had to do. See, the early church had a passion. They had a passion 
to do what the apostles were teaching them. The apostles, they just witnessed the power of God. They just witnessed Jesus himself being resurrected from the grave, being ascended into heaven. They had the power. They saw with their own eyes. They had something within them, deep within them, that says, I've got to do what God has called me to do. They wanted to hear the very teachings of Jesus. They wanted to hear about his life. They wanted to hear what he called them to do because they had something. They had something that you and I have. We have the same Holy Spirit power that they had. And we should have the umption of the Holy Spirit to work within our lives, to hear God's word, to have a heart after God, to know that God wants to use me in a mighty way and he can use me in the same power that he used the early church with his power through the power of the Holy Spirit. They wanted to hear God's word. There is an exciting sense of wonder and anticipation. There was an exciting sense of wonder and anticipation. Knowing that God is going to use them. Thousands of people giving their life to Christ. People being baptized. Allowing their sense of giftedness to be served in the church. There was an awe and wonder and anticipation. What is God going to do next? What excitement is he going to give me? What is he going to allow me to be part of? What can I do for him? And if we can have that sense of awe and wonder, knowing that I am a vessel that can be used of God in a mighty way, we can have the same power of the early church. In verse 43 it says, And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and wonder through the apostles and through their life. And then there are unexplained blessings occurring. There were unexplained blessings occurring. People were being added to the church daily. Why is that? It's because the body of Christ that was used by the Spirit of God were communicating daily in house to house and in the temple, breaking of bread and in prayers that God did supernatural things within their life. And the greatest gift that we have to somebody is giving our faith, giving our life, to others, letting them know that Jesus died on the cross, that Jesus forgave them of their sins, and the greatest mandate that God has given to us is to reproduce ourselves in Christ to others. There's an awe and wonder when God chooses you. He chose you to do something great and wonderful. And when God uses you, and God allows you to serve and to help and to transform somebody else's life. That sense of awe and that wonder as we were watching that video. You're not worrying whether they serve donuts or fruit in the cafeteria. You're wondering, is the power of God going to show up in church today? Can God's word be preached in a way that people's lives will be changed? When somebody walks in our doors that are hurting, that's, that's estranged within their family, that's maybe really going through a lot of issues, Will God touch their life? There was a sense of awe and anticipation and wonder. There was unexplained blessings occurring, things that we don't understand that God is going to work in a mighty way. And there was a warm sense of community and belonging. They they cared about each other. They cared about each other. These are characteristics of the early church that I believe that if we absolutely get into people's lives and care and get into their lives and help to let them know that the greatest gift that we have is the power of God within our life and God can transform their lives. We can't do everything for everybody that walks through our doors. But the greatest thing that we can do is to give them the hope and the help and the power of God. Because when we understand the sense of wonder that the early church had, they, 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 they cared. There was empathy within their life. There was something there that when somebody came in the door, they knew that they weren't them against us or we don't fit in, we're just like, we, we have empathy within our life and we care. There was a sense of community and belonging. And then I like this, and this is what Allie was talking about. There's an outward focus. There was an outward focus. And I believe our society today and our churches in America have this one major issue going on. They are so inward focused. They care about what they go through. They they, they care about what they like. 
They want to be entertained. And I believe that's the reason why the churches have stagnated and declined. Because if we do not change how we look at others, how we minister to others, how we evangelize others, what we do is we implode upon ourselves. The older keep on getting older. And if the older of our church, if the church is only built on the Christians that are already here, and we don't evangelize the children and the youth of our church, and we do not keep on getting younger, what we do is we pass over the grave, and our church keeps on getting older, and we die. We cannot allow the death of evangelism. We cannot allow us to be so inwardly focused that we don't care what others need. What we have to do is we have to look at the world and say, how can we evangelize? How can we get out of our comfort zone? How can we get into other people's lives and change them by giving to them the power of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ? How we do that is we have to become outward focused. We can't worry about what we like all the time. We have to worry about what works. Ministry. The word of God doesn't change. The gospel is pure. The gospel is unchanging. But how we share the gospel to this world is so vitally important. How we get the gospel to Colombia, how we get the gospel to Africa, how we get the gospel to unchurched, unsaved individuals is vitally important. And the Bible tells us that Jesus says, go. Go make disciples. In other words, go give your life out. Go into all the world. Share the love of Jesus to everyone that you contact with. And if you share the love of Jesus, you will change their life and transform them that they will be followers of Christ. And I am going to give you the authority and power in order to do that. We do not have to serve God in an outward focus in our own power. We can serve God by serving others with His power and His authority. You know, I think it's so important in our churches today that I I want myself and I want you to become uncomfortable. I don't want you to like all the music. I don't want you to like all the sermons. I don't like, I don't want you to like everything that takes place within the church. Because if we like everything that takes place, if it's ours, and I I, I like our church because I like everything that fits in, guess what's going to take place? The outside world is going to come in here and they're going to say, that's very churchy. And I understand why you like everything. But what we want to do is we want to become uncomfortable. We want, let me put it this way. If, if, If you were ministering to somebody at work and they were absolutely heathenistic, they, they, they were sinning, they were sinning more than Richard Perez sins. And that's a lot of sin. Okay. I mean, they sin all the time and they come into church and you bring them to church with you. Guess what you want? You want a message, not to the church. You want a message of God that changes their life. And what we have to have is we have to have a sense of awe and wonder and anticipation that when you bring somebody into church that you know that needs a heart after God, that you need to touch from God, that you bring them in and you're praying that, man, I pray that the music is good. I pray that the message is It's okay. I pray that everything is working out so God will impact their life. We have to have a wonder about our service. There has to be a gladness and laughter. A simplicity of heart. We can't be a, a body of Christ that is so negative and mean spirited that if you give your life to Christ, there's no more joy. There's no more happiness. I believe the Christian faith ought to be a faith that changes our lives and changes us. The simplicity and gladness of heart means that we are just very happy with what God has given to us. I am thankful that God has forgiven me. I don't want to be a church. I don't want to be a pastor that walks up here and we come across with a negative spirit and a, and a, and a superior attitude. What we have to do is we have to have a very glad heart, a simplistic heart. One that when somebody walks in the door, they know that the realness of Christ is within me. They see the wonders of Christ. They understand that it's not a negative thing. They understand that it's a transformation that takes place within my life. 
I, I don't like listening to mean, negative preachers. I want to listen to somebody with a happy heart, with somebody that has passion for what they want, somebody that has a passion for God's Word. When I became a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I wanted people to know that it's not about what I want. It's about what Jesus wants through me. And I want people to hear the message. And I do not want to be a stumbling block on how I proclaim the message. I don't want to be a negative proclaimer. I want people to see with a gladness and simplistic heart that there's gladness and laughter and a joyful heart. And the message of Jesus Christ is here to change people, uplift them, give to them a sense of wonder and a heart within their life. Not a negative attitude, but something that changes them in a very positive way. And then there's authenticity and sincerity. I think our church needs to be authentic. I think we can't be a fake. I think we ought to take off the hypocritical mindset, the pharisaical mindset. And I think we ought to be very authentic, very sincere. I think we ought to share our hurts and share our joys. I think we ought to come around people and encourage them because of who they are. And when somebody walks in our doors and somebody needs a touch of Jesus, I think we should be so sincere with them and so authentic with them that we can say, I understand you. There's people in our church that has gone through exactly what you're going through. There's people in what you're going through. And don't say you've got to come in and put the mask on and act a certain way. Come in and say, you know what? A church is a place for sinners to understand that Jesus loves them and forgives them and wants to give them a road to recovery. Because the church has the power of God to change people's lives if we're real, if we're genuine, if we understand that God's power is working within us. And then their worship was celebrated. They, it, it wasn't a negative worship service. They praised God. They opened up their hearts. They allowed God's worship to be real, to celebrate the presence of God. And when you celebrate and you praise God, guess what happens? When we celebrate, when we praise God, when we open up our hearts towards God, God shows up because God is being praised. God is being exalted. And when we exalt the name of Christ, I believe the audience of one is looking at the heart of the individual. And when we praise God, whether we are singing out of a hymn book or singing off the screens, it makes absolutely no difference. What makes a difference is the heart that we have towards him. And if we open up our hearts towards him and we praise his name, we celebrate the name of Christ, I believe God smiles because he looks deep into the heart of the individual. And it may be the only time within the week that you are totally focused on God. And when we totally focus on God, he allows the trueness and the realness of the word of God to come within our hearts and apply the truth and the Holy Spirit of God that lives within you and lives within me is through the cultivation of worship. And when we worship his name and focus on him, he does something to us. He takes our eyes off of our needs, what we desire, and put our eyes on him. And when we put our eyes on him, that's when he starts working within our lives. That's when he can start looking at the issues within your life. And he can start allowing you the truth to be implanted in your heart. And that's when, if we are unsaved, that's when we've got issues going on within our life, how we can start working within our life because we open up our hearts. Now, not everybody worships the same way. Not everybody raises their hand. Not everybody claps their hand. I, have you ever seen the movie The Jerk? That's me trying to, trying to keep beat. I, I can't do it. I'm, I'm sitting there. I've got to watch somebody. Okay, when they clap, I clap. Okay, I, that's how bad I am. I have absolutely no beat. But that doesn't change. I can worship without raising my hand. I can worship without clapping. My worship is I can focus on God, whether I'm loud or whether I'm soft, whether I'm animated or whether I'm reserved. It makes no difference. What makes a difference is where's my heart in the midst of worship? Can I praise God with my heart? So when you look at somebody and somebody raises their hand, praise God. When somebody's quiet, praise God. Don't look, don't judge, 
allow God to be worshipped. Because they are worshipping God. They're not trying to keep you happy or not make you mad. What they're trying to do is focus on what God wants for them in their life. Our worship, praising God, should be something very important. And they have a good reputation in the community. They have a good reputation in the community. They, they found favor with man. And I believe that when we find favor with man, we have a good reputation in our community. That's when people will communicate that church or those people. They have a passion for God. They have a reputation to help. And there, there's a saying that we used to say all the time. What would happen if our community in South Wichita right here, what would happen if Glenville Church did not exist? What would happen if we were gone? Would anybody know? Would anybody care? Would lives still be transformed? Can we take ourselves out of the equation of South Wichita and not make a difference? Because I believe if we don't make a difference, then we are not needed. And if we are not making a difference, what we're saying is we are not using God's power. But if we can look at this community and say, we are making a difference in the community. People's lives are being changed because of our church and because of God's power. We are changing people's lives. Children are getting saved. Youth are giving their life. They are surrendering to doing what God wants them to do. We are making an impact. And if we make an impact in our community, God is the one being glorified. And that's how we can have a good reputation in our community. If we serve the community, if we serve people, if people do see that we change people's lives because of God's power. And then they are growing numerically. How do we stay vibrant? We have to grow. Living things grow. Living things grow. And a church is a living, vibrant organism. What do you mean by that? Is the Spirit of God lives within our hearts. And we are a community. And you have people that you are impacting daily within the lives. And how we continue to become a church that's, that is not stagnatic. Stagnatic. That's stagnant. I make up new words all the time. That's not... <laughs> And we are growing. We are. <laughs> that, was, that was 30 seconds too late, okay? <laughs> if you're going to laugh at me, laugh at me at the time so I know this, what I do. Oh, yeah, I'm just joking. Okay, we cannot be a church that is stale, that is declining. How we continue to do that is this, very simply, go. That mandate was for the children of God. That mandate is to every believer. Go. Not just to the disciples, and not just to the early church. It was to us today. And we can take Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, and take that first word and say, go. Go. Where do I go? Wherever your sphere of influence leads you. It's not that you have to be a preacher. You just have to be a proclaimer. You just have to tell people how God can work within their life. Let God work here. Because if we, Glenville, if we are not growing numerically here, guess what we can't do? We can't send Allie to Columbia. She is going to go on what's called deputation. She's going to probably serve over the next year or two years going to different churches in a lot of different states and share exactly what she shared here. And she is going to want every church to support her on a monthly basis of whether it's $75 to $150 or some maybe $300 a month to give to her so she can go to Columbia. What happens is that she goes to churches that are dead, that are stagnating, that are declining. She goes to those churches and she shares her heart and of course, if the church is stagnated, dead, and declining, there's no offerings coming into the church. So what they have to say to her is, sorry, we can't do it. So she goes to enough churches that say, no, we can't do it. So instead of going to Columbia in two years, it takes her four or five years to get to Columbia to do what God has called her to do because the churches in the United States have lost the power of God. 
how we can impact our community is we can impact our community by sharing Jesus to them. They give their life to Christ. They come into the body of Christ. The growing part of the church now works together. Now when missionaries come to Glenville, we can say, yes, I want to support you so you can go to Columbia. She gets to Columbia in a year. She starts sharing her faith and doing her work. Kids in Columbia give their life to Christ. Why? It's because people at Glenville gave their life to share other people about Jesus. That's how that domino effect happens. If the churches are dead, if Glenville is dead, we cannot fulfill the Great Commission. Go. If we are not serving God with our power, out of his wonder, with excitement, with authenticity, with genuineness, with a sincere heart. What we're saying is to the world, it's all about me. We're saying to the community, it's all about us. And what's going to happen over the next 20 or 30 years, the church that we know today will be dead and off the scene because we lost the power of God today. So we can't be inward focused. We have to be outward focused. We have to know that we have a calling upon our life to go. At work, at school, in our home, and to share the very love of God. The Bible says go into all the world, starting here and then going there. You may never go on a mission field. You may never go on a mission trip. But every time that you give a resource to the church, to missions. What you're saying is to our 70 missionaries, I want to be part. I want to share my life with you so you can share your life with them and God's blessing will be with us throughout the world. Missions, so vitally important. Why is it important? Because it's God's mandate. We can look at those missionaries and we can say, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out and I want you to share the gospel. They come back and report to us. But here's the problem with our missions and our churches. The churches are demanding that our missionaries go over and start churches and win people for Jesus Christ. And that's what they should do. But then they come back to churches that are dead, that are declining, that are stagnated. And the missionaries on the field are doing more than the people at their home. We support them for $75 or $100 a month, and they are doing the job. What my challenge is, I know they will do their job. They've been called by God to accomplish that goal. Our job is to make sure we, the church, is healthy enough, is vibrant enough, is growing enough, that when the missionaries do come in here, that we have the resources, the energy, and the spirit to allow our people that are called by God in different aspects of the United States and in our culture to go share the gospel with a hurting and dying world. Our church, this church, must be healthy. And how do we become healthy? We become healthy by living in God's power, using God's word, not losing the spirit and the wonder of God. And I understand that corporately. We can come to church and we can have a vibrancy in a church service. But it boils down to an individual act. Are you, am I, these things? Can I be outward focused instead of inward focused? Can I worship God? Can all ten of these points be boiled down to me? Because our church is only as good as the individuals within the church. You are the church. I am the church. We come together for corporate worship. But God has called us individually to go, to get out of our comfort zone, to share the love and the forgiveness of God. Could you imagine the disciples watching Jesus, being ready to be ascended into heaven? And the very last words that Jesus tells his disciples says, everything that you've seen me do, 
everything that you've seen me teach you for the last three and a half years, I want you to tell the world. I want you to go. I want you not to keep it to yourself. I don't want you to be a holy huddle where you guys are happy because you got to meet me. He said, go. Get up. Go do. And when you go and tell them about what I have told you, what I've done for you, the forgiveness that I have given to you, when you go tell them that, I want you to know the authority and the power that I have over death, hell, and the grave to conquer the elements. I am giving you that same authority. And I'm giving you the Spirit of God that's greater than me, that's going to live within every person that you communicate to. You will have community. You will have God's power. He says, go. Get up and do it. What would happen if those disciples in the early church didn't do what God called them to do? The forgiveness and the love of God would be small. But God's power is global. It's for all. But the body of Christ, the church, Glenville, and you is called to do one thing. The mission of the church, the purpose of the church is onefold. Go into all the world, Wichita, Columbia, and share the good news of Jesus Christ. That is the transforming, liberating power that can change our culture, that can change the world, that can transform your heart and your life. So where you are struggling, your issues of life, your pain, God said this, before you can go minister to them, well, allow me to take care of your heart, your life. Before we can go into the, all the world, we have to deal with us individually. And there are some here today that are struggling in many different areas. But there's one struggle that every one of us has to deal with. And that struggle is, are you genuinely his child? Have, has there been a time within your life that you said, I need a touch of God. I need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I understand that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I know that I can't get to heaven without him. And right now, I give you my life, and I make you my Lord, and I ask you to forgive me and allow me the opportunity to give my life to you. What Jesus does at that time he allows the forgiveness of God that he has given to all of us to wrap his arms around you and he washes your sins white as snow, buries your sins in the deepest sea, throws it behind his back, he brings it to his remembrance no more and there's nothing greater in our life than forgiveness. And when we understand that God's forgiveness is for every one of us, we can come to worship and we can understand that we do have a power. We do have something that this world doesn't understand. We have the Spirit of God within our life because I have been forgiven. It changes everything. It changes the way that we perceive life. It changes the reason I go to church. It changes everything because I know Everything I have, everything I've gone through, everything the Lord has allowed me to do is because of Him. And He's forgiven me where I failed Him. He loves me unconditionally. And I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. You know what? I can worship His name. I can say thank you. I can understand that there's a purpose that's in my life. And that purpose is to worship Him. To just thank Him for what He's done and to tell other people what God can do for them. If we get that simple point, the mission of the church, we will be successful. We will not become stagnant. We will be a vibrant, growing entity for Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for the power that you've given to us. 
we thank you for the early church and how we can look at their their conditions of their heart and their life and we can apply that to our life. Lord, allow us a sense of need deep within our heart. Not to play the game of Christianity or the game of church. But Christianity would be something that's real. That church is something that we do. We come to church so other people can see Christ and we can reproduce ourselves. That we can take your mission and go. Go into the world and to share what you've done for me. How you've changed my life. How you've forgiven me. And how we can do that for others. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for giving us that power and that authority. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Something to think about. The mission of the church is the same mission that you have on a daily basis.